Welcome back to Paper Cuts, everybody. Uh, last we left off, we uh, finished up the picture of Dorian Gray, and this week we're going to start in on, uh, I believe it's called The Colors of Space. Yes, The Colors of Space. So let's begin. Chapter 1. The Lahari spaceport didn't belong on Earth. Bart Steele had thought that a long time ago when he'd first saw it. He was just a kid then, twelve years old and all excited about seeing Earth for the first time. Earth, the legendary home of mankind before the age of space, the planet of Bart's far-back ancestors. And the first thing he'd seen on Earth when he got off the starship was the Lahari spaceport. And he'd thought right then that it doesn't belong on Earth. He'd said so to his father, and his father's face had gone strange, bitter, and remote. A lot of people would agree with you, son, Captain Rupert Steele had said softly. Trouble is, if the Lahari spaceport wasn't on Earth, we wouldn't be on Earth either. Remember that. Bart remembered it five years later as he got off the strip of moving sidewalk. He turned to wait for Tommy Kendron, who was getting his baggage off the center strip of the moving roadway. Bart Steele and Tommy Kendron had graduated together, the day before, from the Space Academy of Earth. And now Tommy, who had been born on the ninth planet of the star Capella, was taking the Lahari starship to his faraway home, and Bart's father was coming back to Earth on the same, on the same starship to meet his son. Five years, Bart thought. That's a long time. I wonder if Dad will know me. Let me give you a hand with that stuff, Tommy. Wait, wait, wait. Let me give you a hand with that stuff, Tommy. I can manage, Tommy chuckled, hefting the plastic cases. They don't allow you much baggage weight on the Lahari ships. Certainly not more than I can handle. The two lads stood in front of the spaceport gate for a moment. Over the gate, which was high and pointed and made of some clear colorless material like glass, was a jagged symbol resembling a flash of lightning. The sign in Lahari language for the home world of the Lahari. They walked through the pointed glass gate and stood, stood for a moment, by mutual consent, looking down over the vast expanse of the Lahari spaceport. This had once been a great desert, now it was all floored in with some strange substance that was neither glass, metal, nor concrete. It looked like gleaming crystal, though it felt soft underfoot, and in the glare of the noonday sun, it gave back the glare in a million rainbow flashes. Tommy put his hands up to, uh, to his eyes to shield them. The Lahari must have funny eyes if they can stand all this glare. Inside the glass gate, a man in a guard's uniform gave them each a pair of dark glasses. Put them on now, boys, and don't look directly at the ship when it lands. Tommy hooked the earpieces of the dark glasses over his ears and sighed with relief. Bart frowned, but finally put them on. Bart's mother had been a Mentorian, from the planet of Mentor, the star Deneb, a hundred times brighter than the sun. Bart had her eyes, but Mentorians weren't popular on Earth, and Bart had learned to be quiet about his mother. Through the dark lenses, the glare was only a pale gleam. Far out in the very center of the spaceport, a high, clear glass skyscraper rose, catching the sunlight in a million colors. Around the building, small copters and robot cabs veered, discharging passengers, and the moving sidewalks were crowded with people coming and going. Here and there in the crowd, standing out because of their height and the silvery metallic cloaks they wore, were the strange tall figures of the Lahari. Well, how about going down? Tommy said as he glanced impatiently at his timepiece. Less than half an hour before the starship touches down. All right, we can get a sidewalk over here. Reluctantly, Bart tore his eyes from the fascinating spectacle and followed Tommy, stepping onto one of the sidewalks. It bore them down a long, sloping ramp toward the floor of the spaceport and then sped toward the glass skyscraper. It came to rest at the wide, pointed doors, depositing them in the midst of the crowd. The jagged lightning flash was there over the doors in the building, and the words, here by the grace of the Lahari, is the doorway to all the stars. But Bart remembered, as if it were yesterday, how he and his father had first passed through this doorway. And his father, looking up, had said, under his breath, Not for always, son. Someday men will have a doorway to the stars, and the Lahari won't be standing in it. 
Inside the building it was searingly bright. The high, open rotunda was filled with immense mirrors and glass ramps running up and down, moving staircases, confusing signs, and flashing lights on tall, oddly shaped pillars. The place was crowded with men from all over the planet. But the dark glasses they all wore gave them a sort of strange family resemblance. I better check on my I better check on my reservations. Meet you on the upper level later, he said, and got onto a moving staircase that soared slowly upward. Past level after level, toward the information desk located on the topmost mezzanine. The staircase moved slowly, and Bart had plenty of time to see everything. On the step immediately in front of him, two Vahari were standing. With their backs turned, they might have almost been men. Unusually tall, unusually thin, but men. Then Bart amended that mentally. The Lahari had two arms, two legs, and a head apiece. They were that much like men. And their faces had two eyes, two ears, and a nose and mouth all in the right places. But the similarity ended there. They had skin of a curious pale, silvery gray, and pale, pure white hair rising in what looked like a feathery crest. Their eyes were long and slanting, the forehead high and narrow, the nose delicately thin and chiseled with long, vertically slit nostrils, the ears long, pointed, and lobeless. The mouth looked almost human, though the chin was abnormally pointed. The hands would have almost passed inspection as human hands, except for the long, triangular nails curved over the fingertips like the claws of a cat. They wore skin-tight clothes of some metallic silky stuff, and long, flowing, gleaming silvery capes. They looked unearthly, elfin and strange, and in their own way they were beautiful. The two Lahari in front of Bard had been talking softly in their fast, twittering speech, but as the hum of the crowds on the upper levels grew louder, they raised their voices, and Bard could hear what they were saying. He was a little surprised to find that he could still understand the Lahari language. He hadn't heard a word of it in years, not since his mentorian mother had died. The Lahari would never guess that he could understand their speech. Not one human in a million could speak or understand a dozen words of Lahari except for the Mentorians. Do you really think that human? The first Lahari spoke the word as if it were a filthy insult. Will have the temerity to come in by the ship? No reasonable being can tell what humans will do, but then no reasonable being can tell what our own port authorities will do either. If the message had only reached us sooner, it would have been easier. Now I suppose we'll have to clear through a dozen officials and a dozen different kinds of formalities. The younger Lahari seemed angry, and we have only a description, no name, no nothing. How do they expect us to do anything under those conditions? What I can't understand is how it ever happened, or how the man managed to get away. What worries me is the possibility that he may have communicated with the others we don't know about. Those bungling fools who let the first man get away can't even be sure. Do not speak of it here. There are mentorians in the crowd who might understand us. He turned and looked straight at Bart, and Bart felt as if the strange, slanted eyes were looking right through to his bones. And then the Lahari said in universal, who are you, boy? What is your business here? Bart replied in the same language, politely. My father's coming in on this ship. I'm looking for the information deck. Up there, said the old Lahari, pointing with a clawed hand and then lost interest in Bart. He said to his companion in their own language, Always I regret these episodes. I have no malice against humans. I suppose that even this vegan that we are seeking has young, and a mate who will regret his loss. But he shouldn't have pried into Lahari matters if they'd killed him right away. The soaring staircase swooped up to the top level, and the two Lahari stepped off and mingled swiftly with the crowd, being lost to sight. Bart whistled in dismay as he got off and turned down toward the information desk. A vegan. Some poor guy from his own planet was in trouble with the Lahari. He felt a cold, crawling chill down his insides. The Lahari had spoken regretfully, but the way they'd speak of a fly, they couldn't manage to swap fast enough. Sooner or later, he had to get down to it. They weren't human. 
Here on Earth, nothing much could happen, of course. They wouldn't let the Lahari hurt anyone. Then Bard remembered his course and universal law. The Lahari spaceport and every system, by treaty, was Lahari territory. Once he walked beneath the lightning flash sign, the authority of the planet ceased to function. He might as well be on that unbelievably remote homeworld in another galaxy that was the Lahari home planet. That, that world that no human had ever seen. On a Lahari spaceport or on a Lahari ship, you were under the jurisdiction of the Lahari law. Tommy stepped off a moving stair and joined him. The ship's on time, reported past Luna City a few minutes ago. How about a drink? There was a refreshment stand on this level. They debated briefly between orange juice and a drink with Lahari name that simply meant cold sweet, and finally decided to try it. The name proved descriptive. It was very cold, very sweet, and indescribably delicious. Does this, does this come from the Lahari world, I wonder? I imagine it's synthetic. I suppose it won't hurt us. They wouldn't serve it to us if they would. Oh, men and Lahari are alike in a lot of ways. Breathe the same air, eat about the same food. Their bodies were adjusted to the, their bodies were adjusted to the same gravity. They had the same body chemistry. In fact, you couldn't tell Lahari blood from human, even under a microscope. And in the terrible Ohioans, Orion spaceport back 60 years ago, doctors had found that blood plasma from humans could be used for wounded Lahari, and vice versa, though it wasn't safe to transfuse whole blood. But then, even among humans, there were five blood types. And yet, for all their likeness, they were different. Bart sipped the cold Lahari drink, seeing himself in the mirror behind the refreshment stand. A tall teenager, looking much older than his seventeen years. He was lithe and well-muscled from five years of sports and acrobatics at the Space Academy. He had curling red hair and gray eyes, and he was almost as tall as a Lahari. Dad know me? I was just a little kid when he left me here, and now I've grown up. Tommy grinned at him in the mirror. What are you going to do now that we've finished our so-called education? What do you think? Go back to Vega with Dad, my Lahari ship, and help him run Vega Interplanet. Why else would I bother with all that astrogation and math? You're the lucky one with your father owning a dozen ships. You know, he must be at least as rich as the Lahari. It's not that easy. Space travel inside a system these days is small stuff. All the real travel and shipping goes to the Wahari ships. It was a sore point with everyone. Thousands of years ago, men had spread out from Earth, first to the planets, then to the nearer stars, crawling in ships that could travel no faster than the speed of light. They'd even believe that was an absolute limit, that nothing in the universe could exceed that speed of light. It took years to go from Earth to the nearest star, but they'd done it. From the nearer stars, they sent out colonizing ships all through the galaxy. Some vanished and were never heard from again, but some made it, and in a few centuries, man had spread all over hundreds of star systems. And then man met the people of the Lahari. It was a big universe with measureless millions of stars and plenty of room for more than two intelligent civilizations. It wasn't surprising that the Lahari, who had only been traveling space for a couple thousand years themselves, had never come across humans before. But they'd been delighted to meet another intelligent race, and it was immediately extremely profitable. Because men were still held, mostly, to the planets of their own star systems, ships traveling between the stars by light drive were rare and ruinously expensive. But the Lahari had a warp drive, and almost overnight, the whole picture changed. By warp drive, hundreds of times faster than light at peak, the years-long trip between Vega and Earth, for instance, was reduced to about three months at a price anyone could pay. Mankind could trade and travel all over their galaxy, but they did it all on Lahari ships. The Lahari had an absolute, unbreakable monopoly on star travel. That's what hurts. Wouldn't do us any good to have the star drive. Humans can't stand faster than light travel, except in cold sleep. Bart nodded. The Lahari ships travel at normal speeds, like the regular planetary ships, inside each star system. Then at the borders of the vast gulf of emptiness between stars, they went into warp drive. 
But first, every human on board was given a cold sleep treatment that placed them in suspended animation, allowing their bodies to endure the warp drive. He finished his drink. The increasing bustle in the crowds below them told him that time must be getting short. A tall, impressive-looking Lahari strode through the crowd, followed at a respectful distance by two Mentorians, tall, red-headed humans wearing metallic cloaks like those of the Lahari. Tommy nudged Bard, his face bitter. Look at those lousy Mentorians. How do they do it? Fawning upon the Lahari that way, yet they're as human as we are. Slaves of the Lahari they are. Bart felt the involuntary surge of anger and had it instant control. It's not that way at all. My mother was a Mentorian, remember? She made five cruises on a Lahari ship before she married my father. I guess I'm just jealous. Just think the Mentorians can sign on a Lahari ship as crew, while you and I will never pilot a ship between the stars. What'd she do? She was a mathematician. Before the Lahari met up with men, they used a system of mathematics as clumsy as the old Roman numerals. You have to admire them, when you realize that they learned stellar navigation with that old system, though most ships use human math now. And of course, you know their eyes aren't like ours. Among other things, they're colorblind. They see everything in shades of black or white or gray. So they found out that humans aboard their ships were useful. You remember how humans... In the early days in space, you used certain birds who were more sensitive to impure air than they were. When the birds keeled over, we could tell it was time for humans to start looking over the air systems. The Lahari used Mentorians to identify colors for them, and since Mentor was the first planet a human that the Lahari had contact with, they've always been closer to them. Tommy looked after the two Mentorians enviously. Fact is, I'd ship out with Lahari myself if I could, wouldn't you? Bart's mouth twisted in a wry smile. No, I could. I'm half Mentorian. I speak Lahari. Why don't you? I would. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Not even many Mentorians will. You see, the Lahari don't trust humans too much. In the early days, men were always planting spies on Lahari ships to try and steal the secret of warp drive. They never managed it, but nowadays, the Lahari give all the Mentorians what amounts to a brainwashing. Deep hypnosis, before and after every voyage, so that, so that they can neither look for anything that might threaten the Lahari monopoly of space, nor reveal it, even under a truth drug, if they find it out. You gotta be pretty fanat fanatical about space travel to go through all that. Well, my mother could tell us a lot of... Wait. Oh, this is him continuing to speak. Hmm. You have to be pretty fanatical about space travel to go through that. My mother could tell us a lot of things about her cruises with the Lahari. The, ha the Lahari can't tell a diamond from a ruby except by spectrographic analysis, for instance, and she... He was interrupted by a high gong note sounding, touching off an explosion of warning bells and buzzers all over the enormous building. Bart looked up. The oh, ship must be coming in to land. I'd better check into the passenger side. Well, Bart, I guess this is where we say goodbye. They shook hands, their eyes meeting for a moment in honest grief. In some indefinable way, this parting marked the end of their boyhood. Goodbye, Tom, and good luck. I'm going to miss you. They wrung each other's hands again, hard. And then Tommy picked up his luggage and started down a sloping ramp toward an enclosure marked to passenger entrance. Warning bells rang again. The glare intensified until the glow in the sky was unendurable, but Bart looked anyhow, making out the strange shape of the Lahari ship from the stars. It was huge and strange, glowing with colors Bart had never seen before. It settled down slowly, softly, enormous, silent, vibrating and glowing, and then swiftly faded to white-hot, gleaming blue, dulling down through the visible spectrum to red. And at last, it was just gleaming, glassy, lahari metal color again. High up in the ship's side, a yawning gap slid open, extruding stair steps, and men in lahari began to descend. Bart ran down a ramp and surged out onto the field with the crowd. His eyes alert for his tall, 
His His eyes, alert for his father's tall figure, noted with surprise that the ship's stairs were guarded by four cloaked lahari, each with a mentorian interpreter. They were stopping each person who got off the starship, asking for identity papers. Bart realized he was seeing another segment of the same drama he'd overheard, discussed, and wished he knew what it was all about. The crowd was thinning now. Robot cabs were swerving in, hovering above the ground to pick up passengers and then veering away. The gap in the starship's side was closing, and still Bart hadn't seen the tall, slim, flame-haired figure of his father. The port on the other side of the ship he knew was for loading passengers. Bart moved carefully through the thinning crowd, almost to the foot of the stairs. One of the Lahari checking papers stopped and fixed him with an inscrutable gray stare, and then finally turned away again. Bart really began to worry. Captain Steele would never miss his ship. But he saw only one disembarking passenger who had not been surrounded by a group of welcoming relatives were summoned to Robocab and gone. The man was wearing vegan clothes, but he wasn't Bart's father. He was a fat little man with ruddy cheeks and a fringe of curling gray hair all around his bald dome. Maybe he'd know if there was another vegan on the ship. Then Bart realized the fat little man was staring straight at him. He returned the man's smile rather hesitantly and then blinked, for the fat man was coming straight toward him. Hello, son. The fat man said loudly, and as two Lahare started toward him, the strange man did an incredible thing. He reached out his two hands and grabbed Bart. Well, boy, you've grown, but you're not too grown up to give your old dad a good hug, are you? He pulled Bart roughly into his arms, and Bart started to pull away and stammered that the fat man had made a mistake, but the pudgy hand gripped his wrist with unexpected strength. Bart, listen to me. The stranger whispered in a harsh, fast voice. Go along with us, we're both dead. See the two Lahari watching us? Call me dad, good and loud, if you want to live. Believe me, believe me, your life's in danger right now. For a moment, pulled off balance of the fat stranger's hug, Bart remained perfectly still while the man repeated in that loud, jovial voice, How oh, you've grown! He let him go, stepping away a pace or two, and whispered urgently, Say something, and take that stupid look off your face. As he stepped back, Bart saw his eyes. In the chubby, good-natured red face, the stranger's eyes were half mad with fear. And in that second, Bart remembered that the two Lahari and their talk of a fugitive. In that moment, Bart Steele grew up. He stepped toward the man and took him quickly by the shoulders. Dad, you sure surprised me. Been such a long time, I have forgotten what you look like. Did you have a good trip? Oh, I'm about like always. I can't compare with the trip on the old Asterion, no. The Asterion was the flagship of the Vega Interplanet, Rupert Steele's own ship. I was everything. Beads of sweat were standing out on the man's ruddy forehead, and his grip on Bart's wrist was so hard it hurt. Bart, grasping at random for something to say, gabbled, Oh, too bad you couldn't get to my graduation. I made the third in a class of four hundred. The Lahari had surrounded them and were closing in. And the fat man took a deep breath or two and said, Just a minute, Frank. We watch something? As he turned around, and the tallest of the Lahari, the old one whom Bart had seen on the escalator, looked long and hard at him. When they spoke universal, their voices were sibilant, but not nearly so inhuman. Could we trouble you to show us your papers? Certainly. Nonchalantly, the fat man dug them out and handed them over. Bart saw his father's name printed across the top. The Lahari gestured to a mentorian interpreter. What color is this man's hair? The mentorian said in the Lahari language. His hair is gray. He used the universal word. There were, of course, no words for colors in the Lahari speech. The man we seek has hair of red, and he is tall, not fat. The boy is, the boy is tall and with red hair. The mentorian volunteered, and the old Lahari made a gesture of disdain. 
This boy is twenty years younger than the man whose description came to us. Why did they not give us a picture, or at least a name? He turned to the other Lahari and said in their own shrill speech, I suspected this man because he was alone, and I had seen this boy on the upper mezzanine and spoken with him. We watched him, knowing sooner or later the father would seek him, ask him. He gestured the mentor and said, Who is this man, you? Bart gulped, and for the first time he noticed, noted the energon ray shockers at the belt of the four Lahari. He'd heard about those. They could stun, or they could kill, quite horribly. He said, This is my father. You want my cards, too? He hauled out his idea any papers. My name's Bart Steele. The Lahari, with a gesture of disgust, handed them back. Go then, father and son. Ripkrit Gorbachev. His hand shook on Bart's, and Bart thought, If we're lucky, we can get out of the port before he faints right away. I'll get a copter. And then feeling sorry for the stranger, Bart gave him his arm to lean on. He didn't know whether he was worried or scared. Where was his father? Why did this man have his dad's papers? Was his father hiding inside the Lahari ship? He wanted to run to burst away from the imposter, but the guy was shaking so hard, Bart couldn't just leave him standing there. If the Lahari got him, it was a dead duck. The copter swooped down the pilot's signal, and the little man said hoarsely, No, we robot cap. The Bart waved, Bart waved the copter away, getting a dirty look from the pilot, and then punched a button at the stand for one of the unmanned robot cabs. It swung down and hovered motionless. Bart boosted the fat man in, and inside the man collapsed on the seat, leaning back, puffing. His hand pressed hard to his chest. Uh, a Campbell for dinner. Bart obeyed, obeyed automatically, and then he turned on the man. It's your, it's your game, mister. Now tell me what's going on. Where's my father? The man's eyes were half shut, and he said, gasping, Go ask me any questions for a minute. He thumbed a tablet into his mouth, and presently his breathing quieted. We're safe for the minute. It was Lahari would have cut us down. You, maybe. I, would, I haven't done anything. Look, you, you owe me some explanations. For all I know, you're a criminal, and the Lahari have every right to chase you. Why have you got my father's papers? Did you steal them to get away from the Lahari? Where's my father? If your father, they were looking for you, young fool. Lucky they had only a description and not a name, but they've probably got that by now uncoded. But we've only confused them for a little while. But if you hadn't played along, they'd have had you watched, and when they get a hold of the name Steel, they will sooner or later the people in the Procyon system. Where's my father? I, I don't know. He's still where I left him. He's dead. My name is Briscoe. Edmund Briscoe. Well, your father saved my life years ago. Never mind how. Plus, you know, the safer you'll be for a while. His major worry just now is about you. He was afraid if he didn't turn up here, you'd take the first ship back to Vegas, so he gave me his papers and sent me to warn you. Well, it sounds phony as all can be. How do I know whether to believe you or not? His hand hovered over the RoboCab controls. We're going straight to the police. If you're okay, they won't turn you over to the Lahari. If you're not... You got more than no time for all that. Ask me questions. I can prove I know your father. What was my mother's name? Well, oh God, I never saw her, and your father long before you were born, till he told me I never knew he'd married or had a son. I'd never have known you except you're the living image. Yeah. But I'm a sick man. I'm going to die. I do. I want to do what I came here to do. Your father saved my life once when I was young and healthy. Gave me twenty good years before I got old and fat and sick. Win or lose, I won't live to see on and down like a dog or like my old son. Don't talk like that. If you're sick, let me take you to a doctor. Wait, wait, there's something else. Your father said, tell Bart I've gone looking for the age car. Bart will know what I mean. That's crazy, I don't know. And then he broke off, for the memory had come to him, full blown. He was very young, five, six, maybe seven. His mother, tall and slender and very fair, was bending over a blueprint pointing with a delicate finger at something, straightening, saying in her light, musical voice, The fuel catalyst, it's a strange color, color you never saw anywhere. 
Can you think of a color that isn't red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, or indigo? Some combination of it? It isn't any of the colors of the spectrum at all. It fuels a real eight color. And, the, and his father had used the phrase, almost adopted it. When we know what the eighth color is, we'll have the secret of the star drive, too. Briscoe saw his face change and nodded weakly. But it should be something to you. Now will you do as I tell you? Within a couple of hours, they'll be coming to planet for you. And by that time, the ship I came in on will have taken off. They only stop a short time here for mail, passengers. There are no, no cargo. You may get underway again before all the messages are cleared and decoded. He stopped for a moment, breathing heavily. The Earth Authority might protect you, but you'd never be able to board a Lahari ship again. That means staying on Earth for the rest of your life. You gotta get away before they start comparing notes. Here. Does he have a hand went into his pockets? For your hair to dye or spray. He pressed a button on the bulb in his hand, and Bart gasped, feeling cold wetness on his head. His own hand came st away stained black. Keep still. You'll need it at the end of the pressure and the run. Here. He stuck some papers into Bart's hand, and then punched some buttons on the Robocab's control. It wheeled and swerved so rapidly that Bart fell against the fat man's shoulder. Are you crazy? What are you going to do? Are you crazy? What are you going to do? Misko looked straight into Bart's eyes, and in his hoarse, sick voice, he said, Bart, don't worry about me. It's all over for me, whatever happens. Just remember this. What your father is doing is worth doing. And if you start sawing, arguing, demanding explanations, you can foul up a hundred people and kill about half of them. He closed Bart's fingers roughly over the papers, and the robot cab hovered over the spaceport. Now listen to me very carefully. When I stop the cab, down below, jump out. Don't stop to say goodbye or ask questions or anything else. Just get out, walk straight through the passenger door, and straight off on the ramp of the ship. Show them that ticket and get on. Whatever happens, don't let anything stop you. Bart. Frisco shook his shoulder. Rubbish, whatever happens, you'll get on that ship. Bart swallowed, feeling as if he'd been shoved into a silly cops and robbers game. Briscoe's urgency had convinced him. Where am I going? All I have is a name. Raina 3, and the messenger by the eighth color. That's all I know. His mouth twisted again in that painful gasp. When the cab swooped down, Bart found his voice. What then? Is Dad there? Will I know? I don't know any more than I've told you, Bosco said, and abruptly the robot cab came to a halt, swaying a little. Briscoe jerked the door open, gave Bart a push, and Bart found himself stumbling out on the ramp beside the spaceport building. He caught his balance, he looked around, and realized that the robot cab was already climbing the sky again. Immediately before him, Neon letters spelled to passenger entrance only. Bart stumbled forward, and the Lahari by the gate thrust out a disinterested claw. Bart held up what Briscoe had shoved into his hand, only now seeing that it was a thin wallet, a set of identity papers, and a strip of pink tickets. Christian Alpha, corridor beta, straight through. The Lahari gestured, and Bart went through the narrow passageway, came out at the other end, and found himself at the very base of a curving stair that led up and up and up toward a door in the side of the huge Lahari ship. Bart hesitated. In another minute, he'd be on his way to a strange sun and a strange world on what might well be the wild goose chase of all time. Passengers were crowding the steps behind him, and somebody shouted suddenly, Look at that! Is that guy crazy? Bart looked up. A robot cab was swooping over the spaceport in wild, crazy circles, dipping down, suddenly making a dart like an enraged wasp at a little nest of Lahari. They ducked and scattered. The robot cab swerved away, hovered, and swooped back. This time it struck one of the Lahari grazingly with landing gear and knocked him sprawling. Bart stood with his mouth open as if paralyzed. Boss Briscoe, what was he doing? The fallen Lahari lay without moving. The robot cab moved in again as if for the kill buzzing viciously overhead and then a beam of light arced from one of the drawn energon ray tubes. The robot cab glowed briefly red and then seemed to sag, sink together, and then puddled, a slag heap of molten metal on the glassy floor of the port. A little groan of hair came from the crowd, and Bart felt, like a, felt a sudden wrenching sickness. It had been like a game, a silly game of cops and robbers, 
and suddenly it was as serious as melted death lying there on the spaceport. Brisco. Someone shoved him and said, Come on, quit gawking, kid. They won't hold the ship all day just because some nut finds a new way to off himself. Bart, his legs numb, walked up the ramp. Briscoe had died to give him this chance, and that was up to him to make it worth having. At the top of a ramp, the Lahari glanced briefly at his papers and motioned him through. Bart passed through the airlock and into a brightly lit corridor half full of passengers. The line was moving, albeit slowly, and for the first time Bart had a chance to think. He'd never seen violent death before. In this civilized world, you just didn't see it. He knew if he thought about Briscoe, he'd start bawling like a baby, so he swallowed hard a couple of times, set his chin, and concentrated on the trip to Procyon Alpha. That meant that the ship was outbound on the Aldebaran run. Proxima Centauri, Sirius, Pollux, Procyon, Capella, and Aldebaran. The line of passengers was disappearing through a doorway. A woman ahead of Bart turned and said nervously, We won't be putting a cold sleep right away, will we? And he reassured her, remembering his inbound trip five years ago. No, no, the ship won't go into warp drive until we're well past Pluto. It'll be several days at least. Beyond the doorway, the lights dwindled, and a mentorian interpreter took us dark glasses and said, Kindly remove your belt, shoes, and other accessories of leather or metal before stepping into the decontamination chamber. They will be separately decontaminated and returned to you. Papers, please. With a small twinge of fright, Bart surrendered them. Would the mentorian ask why he was carrying two wallets? Inside the other one, he still had his Academy ID card, which identified him as Bart Steele, and if the mentorian looked through them to check and found out he was carrying two sets of identity papers. But the mentorian merely dumped all his pocket paraphernalia without looking it into a, looking it into a sack. Just step through here. Holding up his trousers with both hands, Bart stepped inside the indicated cubicle. It was filled with a faint bluish light, and Bart felt a strong tingling and a faint electrical smell, and along his forearms there was a slight prickling where the small hairs were all standing on end. He knew the invisible R rays were killing all the microorganisms in his body, so that no disease, germ, or stray fungus would be carried from planet to planet. The bluish light died, and outside the mentorian gave him back his shoes and belt, handed him the paper sack of his belongings, and a paper cup full of greenish fluid. Drink this. What is it? The medic said patiently. Remember, the R-rays killed all the microorganisms in your body, including the good ones, the antibodies that protect you against disease, and the small yeasts and bacteria that live in your intestines and help in the digestion of your food. So we have to replace those you need to stay healthy. See? The green stuff tasted a little brackish, but Bart got it down all right. He didn't much like the idea of drinking a solution of germs, but he knew that was silly. There was a big difference between disease germs and a helpful bacteria. Another mentorian official, this one a young woman, gave him a key with a numbered tag and a small booklet with Welcome Aboard printed on the cover. The tag was numbered 246B, which made Bart raise his eyebrows. B-class was usually too expensive for Bart's father's modest purse. It, was, it wasn't quite the luxury class A, reserved for planetary governors and ambassadors and the like, but it was plenty luxurious. Briscoe had certainly sent him traveling in style. B-deck was a long corridor with oval doors, and Bart found one numbered 246 and not surprisingly, the key opened it. It was a pleasant little cabin, measuring at least six feet by eight, and he'd evidently have it to himself. There was a comfortably large bunk, a light that could be turned off and on, instead of the permanent glow walls of the cheaper class, a private shower and toilet, and a placard on the walls informing him that passengers in beta class had the freedom of the observation dome in the recreation lab. There was even a row of buttons dispensing synthetic foods, in case a passenger preferred privacy or didn't want to wait for meals in the dining hall. A buzzer sounded and a mentorian voice announced, Five minutes to room check. Passengers will please remove all metal in their clothing and deposit in the lead drawers. Passengers will please recline in their bunks and fasten the retaining straps before the steward arrives. Repeat, passengers will please... 
Bart took off his belt, stuck it and his cufflinks in the drawer, and lay down. And then in a sudden panic, he got up again. His papers and his Bart steel were still in the sack. He got them out, and it, with a feeling as if he were tossing a bridge and burning it after him, tore up every scrap of paper that identified him as Bart Steele of Vega Four, graduate of the Space Academy of Earth. Now, for better or for worse, he was... Who was he? He hadn't even looked at the new papers Brusco had given him. He glanced through them quickly. They were made out to David Warren Briscoe of Aldebaran Four. According to them, David Briscoe was twenty years old, hair black, eyes hazel, height six foot one inch. Bart wondered painfully if Briscoe had a son and if David Briscoe knew where his father was. There was also a license validated with four runs of the Aldebaran Intrasatellite Cargo Company, planetary ships, with the rank of apprentice astrogator and a considerable sum of money. Bart put the papers in his pants pocket and the torn up scraps of his old ones in the trash bin before he realized they looked exactly like what they were, torn up legal identity papers and a broken plastic card. Nobody destroyed it any papers for any good reason. What could he do? Then he remembered something from the Academy. Starships were closed system cycles. No waste was discarded, but everything was collected in big chemical tanks, broken down to separate elements and purified, and then built up again into new materials. He threw the paper into the toilet, worked the plastic card back and forth and back and forth until he'd wrenched it into inch-wide bits and then threw it in after them. The cabin door opened and a mentorian said, irritably, Please lie down and fasten your straps. I haven't all day. Hastily, Bart flushed the toilet and went to the bunk. Now that everything could identify him as Bart Steele was on its way to the breakdown tanks. Before long, the complex hydrocarbons and cellulose would all be innocent little mark molecules of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. They might turn up in new combinations as sugar on the table. The mentorian grumbled, You young people think the rules mean everybody but you, and strapped him far too tightly into the bunk. Bart felt resentful. Just because Mentorians could work on Lahari ships, did they have to act as if they owned everybody? And when the man had gone, Bart drew a deep breath. Was he really doing the right thing? If he'd refused to get out of the robot cab, if he'd driven Briscoe straight to the police, then maybe Briscoe would still be alive, and now it was too late. A warning siren went off in the ship, rising to hysterical intensity. Bart thawed incredulously. This is really happening. It felt like a nightmare. His father, a fugitive from the Lahari, Briscoe dead, he himself traveling with forged papers to a star he'd never seen. He braced himself, knowing the siren was the last warning before takeoff. First, there would be the hum of great turbines deep in the ship, and the crossing surge of acceleration. He'd made a dozen trips inside the solar system, but no matter how often he did it, there was the strange excitement. The little pinpoint of fear, like an exotic taste, it was almost pleasant. The door opened, and Bart grabbed a fistful of bed ticking as two Lahari came into the room. One of them said in their strange, shrill speech, This boy is the right age. Bart froze. You're seeing spies in every corner, Ransel, said the other, and then in Universal, Could we travel you for your papers, sir? Bart, strapped down and helpless, moved his head toward the drawer, hoping his face didn't betray his fear, and he watched the two Lahari riffle through his papers with their odd pointed claws. What is your planet? Bart bit his lip hard. He'd almost said Vega Four. Oh, the Baron Four. The Lahari said in his own language, We should have Margin in here. I actually saw them. The other replied, but I saw the mean that dis machine that disintegrated high still say there was enough protoplasm residue for two bodies. Bart fought to keep his face perfectly straight. Did anyone, did anyone come into your cabin? Only the steward. Why? Is there something wrong? There is some thought that a stowaway might be on board. Of course, we could not allow that. Anyone not properly protected would die in the first shift into warp drive. Just the steward, a mentorian. You are 
ill or discommoded? Bart grasped at random for an excuse. That that stuff the medic made me drink made me feel feel sort of sick. You may send for a medical officer after acceleration. A summoning bell is at your left. They turned and went out, and Bart gulped. Lahari in person, checking the passenger decks. Normally you never saw one on board, just the Mentorians. Lahari treated the humans as if they were too dumb to bother about. Well, at least for once, someone was acting as if humans were worthy antagonists. We'll show them, someday. But he felt very alone and scared. And a low hum rose somewhere in the ship, and Bart grabbed ticking as he felt the slow surge. And then a violent sense of pressure popped his eardrums. Weight crowded down on him like an elephant sitting on his chest. There was a horrible, squashed sensation dragging his limbs out of shape. It grew and grew, and Bart lay still and sweated. Trying... Oh, excuse me. Trying to ease his uncomfortable position. Unable to move so much as a finger. The Lahardi ships... The Lahari ships hit twelve gravities in the first surge of acceleration. Bart felt as if he were spreading out under the weight into a puddle of flesh. Melted flesh like briscoes. Bart writhed and bit his lip till he could taste blood, wishing he were young enough to bawl out loud. And then abruptly it eased, and the blood started to flow again in his numbed limbs. Bart loosened his straps, took a few deep breaths, and wiped his face, being wet with whether with sweat or tears he wasn't sure, and sat up in his bunk. The loudspeaker announced, Acceleration 1 has completed. Passengers on Alpha and Beta decks are invited to witness the passing of the satellites from the observation lounge in half an hour. Bart got up and washed his face, remembering that he had no luggage with him, not so much as a toothbrush. At the back of his mind, packed up in a corner, was the continuing worry about his father, the horror of Briscoe's ghastly death, and the fear of the Lahari. But he slammed the lid firmly on them all. For the moment, he was safe. And they might be looking for Bart's steel by now, but they weren't looking for David Briscoe of Aldebaran. He might just as well relax and enjoy the trip. He went down to the observation lounge. It had been darkened, and one whole room, and one whole wall of the room was made of clear quartzite. Bart drew a deep breath as the vast panorama of space opened out before him. They were, they were receding from the sun at some thousands of miles a minute, swirling past the ship, gleaming in the reflected sunlight like iron filings moving to the motion of a magnet with waves upon waves of cosmic dust. Tiny free electrons, ions, particles of gas, free of the heavier atmosphere, themselves invisible, they formed in their billions into bright clouds around the ship, pale, swirling veils of mist. And through their dim shine, the brilliant flares of the fixed stars burned clear and steady, so far away that even the hurling motion of the ship could not change their positions. One by one, he picked out the constellations. Aldebaran swung with a pendant chain of Taurus like a giant ruby. Orion strode across the sky, a swirling nebula at his belt. Vega burned a cobalt blue in the heart of Lear. Colors, colors. Inside the atmosphere of the Earth's night, the stars had been pale white sparks against black. And here, against the misty pale swirls of cosmic dust, they burned with color heaped on color. The, bo the bloody burning crimson of the Antares, the metallic gold of Capella, the sullen pulsing of Beetlejuice, they burned, each with its own inward flame and light, like handfuls of burning jewels flung by some giant hand upon the swirling darkness. It was a sight Bart felt he could watch forever and still be hungry to see, the never-changing, ever-changing colors of space. Behind him in the darkness, after a long time, someone said softly, Imagine being a Lahari and not being able to see anything out there but brighter, brighter light. A bell rang melodiously in the ship, and the passengers in the lounge began to stir and move toward the door, to stretch limbs cramped like Bart's by tranced watching, to talk quickly of ordinary things. I suppose that bell means I suppose that bell means dinner, said a vaguely familiar voice at Bart's elbow. Synthetics, I suppose, but at least we can all get acquainted. The light from the undarkened hall fell on their faces as they moved toward the door. Bart? 
Why, it can't be. In utter dismay, Bart looked down into the face of Tommy Kendren. In the rush of danger, he'd completely forgotten that Tommy Kendren was on this ship, to make his alias useless. Tommy was looking at him in surprise and delight. Why didn't you tell me? Or did you and your father decide at the last minute? Hey, it's great that we can go part of the way together, at least. Bart knew that he must cut this short very quickly. He stepped out into the full corridor light so Tommy could see his black hair. I'm sorry. You're confusing me with someone else. Bart, come off of it. Oh, sorry. I could have sworn you were a friend of mine. Bart wondered suddenly. Had he done the wrong thing? He had a feeling he might need a friend badly. But it was too late now. He stared Tommy in the eye and said, I've never seen you before in my life. Tommy looked deflated, and he stepped back slightly, shaking his head. I've never seen such a resemblance. Are you a vegan? No. Uh, Aldebar, I'm David Briscoe. Glad to know you, Dave. With undiscourageable friendliness, Tommy stuck out a hand. Say, that bell means dinner. Why don't we go down together? I don't know a soul on the ship, and it looks like luck. Running into a fellow who could be my best friend's twin brother. Bart felt warmed and drawn, but sensibly he knew he couldn't give up the pretense. He couldn't keep up the pretense. Sooner or later, he'd give himself away, use some habitual phrase or gesture Tommy would recognize. Should he take a chance, reveal himself to Tommy, and ask him to keep quiet? No, this wasn't a game. One man was already dead. He didn't want Tommy to be next. There was only one way out. He said coldly, "Thank you, but I have other things to attend to." I intend to be very busy all through the voyage. He spun on his heel and walked away before he could see Tommy's eager, friendly smile turn hurt and defensive. Back in his cabin, he gloomily dialed some synthetic jellies, thinking with annoyance of the anticipated good food of the dining room. He knew he couldn't risk meeting Tommy again, and he drearily resigned himself to staying in his cabin. It was beginning to look like an awfully boring trip ahead, and it was. It was a week before the Lahari ship went into warp drive, and all that time, Bart stayed in his cabin, not daring to go to the observation lounge or dining hall. He got tired of eating synthetics. Well, they were nourishing enough, but they were altogether uninteresting. And tired of listening to the tapes the room steward got him from the ship's library. By the time they'd been in space a week, he was so bored with his own company that even the Mentorian medic was a welcome sight when he came in to prepare him for cold sleep. Bard had had the best education on Earth, but he didn't know precisely how the Lahari warp drive worked. He'd been told that only a few of the Lahari understood it, just as a man flew it who flew a copter didn't need to understand Newton's three laws of motion in order to get himself back and forth to work. But he knew this much. When the ship accelerated the frequencies, or rather, when the ship generated the frequencies which accelerated it beyond the speed of light, in effect, the ship went into a sort of fourth dimension and came out of it a good many light years away. As far as Bart knew, no human being had ever survived warp drive except the suspended animation which they called cold sleep. While the medic was professionally reassuring him and strapping him in his bunk, Bart wondered what the humans would do with the Lahari star drive if they had it. Well, he supposed they could use automation in their ships. The Mentorian paused, needle in hand. Do you wish to be wakened for the week we shall spend in each of the Proxima, Sirius, and Pollux systems, sir? You can, of course, be given enough drug to keep you in cold sleep until we reach the Procyon system. Bart wondered if the room steward had mentioned the passengers so bored with the trip that he didn't even mention visit the observation lounge. He felt tempted. He was getting awfully tired of staring at the walls. And on the other hand, he wanted very much to see other star systems. When he passed through them on the trip to Earth, he'd been much too young to pay attention. Firmly, however, he set the temptation aside. Better not to risk meeting other passengers, Tommy especially, if he decided he couldn't take the boredom. The needle went into his arm, and he felt himself sinking into sleep, and in sudden panic realized that he was helpless. The ship would touch down on three worlds, and on any of them the Lahari might have his description or his alias. He would be taken off, drug and unconscious, and might never wake up. He tried to move to protest, to tell him he was changing his mind, but he was already unable to speak. There was a fleeting moment of intense, painful cold, and he was floating in what felt like waves of cosmic dusk, 
swirling many colors before his eyes. And there was nothing, no color, nothing at all except the nowhere night of sleep. Bart felt cold. He stirred, moved his head in drowsy protest, and then memory came flooding back, and in sudden panic he sat up, flinging out his arms as if to ward away anyone who'd lay hands on him. Easy, said a soothing voice. A mentorian, the same mentorian, bent over. We've just reached the gravitational field of Procyon Planet Alpha, Mr. Briscoe. Touchdown in four hours. And Bart mumbled an apology. Think nothing of it. Quite a number of people who aren't used to the cold sleep drugs suffer from minor lapses of memory. How do you feel now? Bart's legs were numb and his hands tingled when he sat up. His body processes had been slowed so much by the cold sleep that he didn't even feel hungry. The synthetic jelly he'd eaten just before going to sleep wasn't even digested yet. When the Mentorian left for another cabin, Bart looked around and suddenly felt he would stifle if he stayed here another minute. He wasn't likely to run into Tommy twice in a row, and if he did, well, Tommy would probably remember the snub he'd had and stay away from Dave Briscoe. And he wanted another sight of the stars before he went into worry and danger. He went into the observation lounge, and the cosmic dust was brighter out here, and the constellations looked a little flattened. Textbook tables came back to him. He traveled 47 light years. He couldn't remember how many billions of miles that was. Even so, it was the tiniest hop, skip, and jump in the measureless vastness of space. The ship was streaking toward Procyon, a Sol-type star. Bright yellow with three planets, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma, ringed like Saturn and veiled in shimmering layers of cloud, swung against the night. Past them, other stars, brighter stars, faraway stars he would never see, glimmered through the pale dust. Hello? Hello, Dave. Been space-sick all this time? Remember me? I met you about six weeks ago in the lounge down here just out from Earth. Oh, no. Bart turned with a mental groan to face Tommy. I've been in cold sleep, he said, and he couldn't. He couldn't be here again. What a dull way to face a long trip. I've enjoyed every minute of it myself. It was hard for Bart to realize that, for Tommy, their meeting had been six weeks ago. It all seemed dreamlike. The closer he came to it, the less he could realize that in a few hours he'd be getting off on a strange world, with only the strange name Rainer Three as a guide. He felt terribly alone, and having Tommy close at hand helped, even though Tommy didn't know he was helping. Perhaps I should have stayed awake. You should. I only slept for a couple of hours at each warp drive shift. We had a day-long stopover at Sirius 18. I took a tour of the planet. I spent a lot of time down there just stargazing. Not that it did me much good. Which one's on Taurus? How do you tell it from Aldebaran? I'm always getting them mixed up. Aldebaran. That's the big red one there. Think of the constellation Taurus as a necklace, with Aldebaran hanging from it like a locket. Antares is much further down in the sky in relation to the arbitrary sidereal axis, and it's a deeper red, like a burning coal, while Aldebaran's like a ruby. He broke off in mid-word, realizing that Tommy was gazing at him in a mixture of triumph and consternation. Too late, Bard realized he'd been tricked. Studying for an exam the year before, he'd explained the difference between the two red stars in almost the exact same words. Bard, I knew it had to be you. Why didn't you tell me, fella? Bart felt himself start to smile, but it only stretched his mouth. He said very low, Don't say my name out loud, Tom. I'm in terrible trouble. Why didn't you tell me? What's that friend for? We can't talk here. All the cabins are wild for sound in case somebody stops breathing or has a heart attack in space. Bart said, glancing around. They went and stood at the very foot of the court's window, seeming to tread the brink of a dizzying gulf of cosmic space and talked in low tones while Alpha and Beta and Gamma swelled up like blown-up balloons in the port. Tommy listened, almost incredulous. And you're hoping to find your father with no more information than that? It's a huge universe. The Lahari ships, according to the little tourist pamphlet, they gave me touchdown, not at nine hundred... Nine hundred and twenty-two different stars in this galaxy alone! Bart visibly winced, and Tommy urged, Come to Capella with me. 
You can stay with my family as long as you want to and appeal to the interplanet authority to find your father. They'd protect him against the Lahari, surely, and you can't chase him all over the galaxy. Playing an interplanetary spy all by yourself, Bart. But Briscoe had deliberately gone to his death to give Bart the chance to get away. He wouldn't have died to send Bart into a trap he could have easily sprung on Earth. Thanks, Tommy, but I gotta play it my way. Tommy said firmly, Count me in, then. My ticket has stopover privileges. I'll get off at Procyon with you. And it was a temptation. To have a friend at his back. He put his hand on Tommy's shoulder, grateful beyond words, but fresh horror seized him as he remembered the terrible words. The terrible words in the horrible puddle of the melted rowboat cab with Briscoe somewhere in the residue. Protoplasm, protoplasm residue enough for two bodies. He couldn't let Tommy face that. Tommy, I appreciate it. Tommy, I, I appreciate that. Believe me, but if I did find my father and his friends, I don't want anything tracing. I don't want anyone tracing me. You'd only make the danger worse. I. Well, the best thing you can do is to stay out of it. Tommy faced him squarely. One thing's for sure. I'm not going to let you go off and never know whether you're alive or dead. I'll try to get a message to you if, if I can. But whatever happens, Tommy, stay with the ship. Go on to Capella. It's the one thing you can do to help me. A warning bell rung in the ship, and he broke sharply away from Tommy, saying it over his shoulder. It's all you can do to help, Tom. Do it. Please, just stay clear. Tommy re reached out and caught his arm. Okay, I will, but you be careful. You hear me? And if I don't hear from you in some reasonable time, I'll raise a stink from here to Vega. Bart broke away and ran. He was afraid that if he didn't, well, he'd break up again. He closed the cabin door behind him, trying to calm down so that the mentorian steward, coming to strap him in for deceleration, wouldn't see how upset he was. He was going to need all his nerve. He finally went through another. He went through another decam. Words are hard. Let's try that again. He went through another decam. De decontamination. Let's try again. He went through another de decontamination. <sighs> He went through another decontamination chamber and finally moved with a line of passengers out of the yawning airlock under that strange sun into the strange world. At first sight, it was a disappointment. It was a Lahari spaceport that lay before him, to all appearance it's identical with the one on Earth. Sloping glass ramps, tall colorless pylons, a skyscraper terminus crowded with men of all planets. But the sun overhead was brilliant and clear gold. The shadows sharp and violent on the spaceport floor. Behind the confines of the spaceport, he could see the ridges of tall hills and unfamiliarly colored trees. He longed to explore them, but he got a grip on his imagination, surrendering his ticket stub and false papers to the Lahari and Mentorian interpreter who guarded the ramp. Lahari said to the Mentorian in the Lahari language, Keep him for questioning. Keep him for questioning, but don't tell him why. Bart felt a cold chill, icing his spine. This was it. We wish to check on the proper antibody component for all the Boron natives. There will be a delay of about thirty minutes. Will you kindly wait in this room here? The room was comfortable, furnished with chairs and a small vision screen with a colorful story moving on it. Some bright figures in capes, curious beasts racing across an unusual belt. But Bart paced the floor restlessly. There were two doors in the room. Through one of them, he had been admitted, and he could see through the glass door the silhouette of the Mentorian outside. The other was opaque and marked in large letters, Danger! Humans must not pass without special lenses, Type X. Ordinary space lenses will not suffice. Danger! Lahari opening. Adjust X lenses before opening. Bart read the sign again. Well, that was no way out for sure. He'd heard the Lahari sun was almost five hundred times as bright as Earth's. 
The Mentorians alone among humans could endure the horror lights. And he supposed the warning was for ordinary spaceport workers. A sudden, rather desperate plan occurred to Bart. He didn't know how much light he could tolerate. He'd never been on Mentor, but he had inherited some of his mother's tolerance for light, and blindness would be better than being burned down with an energon gun. He went hesitantly toward the door and pushed it open. His eyes exploded into pain, but automatically his eyes went up to shield him. Light. Light. He'd never known such cruelly glowing light. Even after the lids... Even through the lids there was pain in red afterimages, but after a moment opening, a, opening them a slit, he found that he could see and made out other doors, glass ramps, pale Lahari figures coming and going. But for the moment he was alone in the long corridor, beyond which he could see the glass ramps. Nearby, a door opened into a small office with glass walls. On a peg, one of the silky metallic cloaks worn by Mentorians doing spaceport work was hanging. On an impulse... Bart caught it up and flung it around his shoulders. It felt it, it felt cool and soft, and the hood shielded his eyes a little. The ramp leading down to what he hoped was street level was terribly steep, and there were no steps. Bart eased himself over the top of the ramp and let go. He whooshed down the slick surface on the flat of his back, feeling the metal of the cloak heat with the friction, and came to a breathless, jarring stop at the bottom. Phew, what a slide. Three stories, at least. But there was a door, and outside the door, maybe safety. A voice hailed him in Lahari. You there. Bart could see well now. He met at the form of a Lahari, only a colorless blob in the intense light. You people know better than to come back here without glasses. Do you want to be blinded, my friend? He actually sounded kind and concerned. Bart tensed, his heart pounding. Now that he was caught, could he bluff his way out? He hadn't actually spoken the Lahari language in years, though his mother had talked to him when he was young enough to learn it, without a trace of accent. And now he's got to try. Marjo sent me the check, he improvised quickly. They were holding someone for questioning. He seems to have gotten away somehow, so why don't make sure he didn't come through here? What's the matter that one... What's the matter that one man can give us this all the slip this way? Well, one thing's for sure. He's vegan, a Solarian, a Capellian, one of the dim star people. If he comes through here, we'll catch him easily enough while he's stumbling around half blind. You know that you shouldn't stay long. Out this way. Don't come back out. Don't come back here without your special lenses. Bart nodded, jerking the cloak around his shoulders, forcing himself not to break into a run as he stepped through the door the Lahari indicated. It closed behind him, and Bart blinked, feeling as if he'd stepped into pitch darkness. Only slowly did his eyes adapt, and he became aware that he was standing in a city street in the full glow of Procyon sunlight, and apparently outside the Lahari spaceport entirely. He'd better get to cover. He took off the Mentorian cloak and thrust it under his arm. He raised his eyes, which were adjusting to ordinary light again, and stopped dead. Just across the street was a long, low, rainbow-colored building, and the ship and the letters. Bart blinked, thinking his eyes deceived him, but they did spell out. Eight colors, Transshipping Corporation. Cargo, passengers, messages, express. A. Rayner 1, manager. Alright, folks, uh, we are at the time of the, uh, time of the journey we're going on to take a short intermission. So, I'm going to go, uh, snag some water, get up and walk around, and I would suggest that you all do the same. Maybe have some food if you all have the calories left. We'll see you in a little bit. Okay, welcome back from the intermission. I hope you all had enough time to uh, get yourself some water, take a short break. Let's resume, shall we, with Chapter 5. For a moment, the world swirled before Bart's still watery eyes. He wiped them, trying to steady himself. Had he so soon reached the end of his dangerous quest? Somehow he had expected it to lie in deep, dark concealment. Rainer won. The existence of Rainer 1 presupposed a Rainer 2 and probably a Rainer 3, for all he knew, Rainers 4, 5, 6, and 66. The building looked solid and real, and evidently had been there a long time. With his hand on the door, he hesitated. Was it, after all, the right eight colors? But it was a family saying. 
Hardly the sort of thing you'd be apt to hear outside. He pushed the door and went in. The room was filled with brighter light than the Procyon sun out so outdoors, and the edges of the furniture rimmed with neon in the Mentorian fashion. A prim-looking girl sat behind a desk, or what could have been a desk, except it looked more like a mirror with little sparkles of lights, different colors and regular rows along one edge. The mirror top itself was blue-violet and gave her skin and violet eyes a bluish tinge. She was smooth and lacquered and glittering, and she raised her eyebrows at Bart as if he were some strange form of life he had been, that she hadn't seen very often. I, uh, I'd like to see Rainer one. Her dainty pointed fingernail, varnished blue, stabbed it at points of light. On what business? she asked, not caring. If it's a personal matter, then I suggest you see him at his home. It can't wait that long. The girl studied the glassy surface and punched at some more little lights. Name, please. David Briscoe. He had thought her perfect painted face could not show any emotion except disdain, but it did. She looked at him in open, blank consternation, and she said into the vision screen, He calls himself David Briscoe. Yes, I know. Yes, sir, yes. She raised her face and it was controlled again, but not forward. Rainer Mund will see you. Through that door and down to the end of the hall. At the end of the hallway was another door. He stepped through into a small cubicle, and the door slid shut, closing trap. He whirled in panic, and then subsided in foolish relief as the cubicle began to rise. It was just an automatic elevator. It rose higher and higher, stopping with an abrupt jerk, and slid open into a lighted room and office. A man sat behind a desk, watching Bart step from the elevator. The man was very tall and very thin, and the gray eyes and the intensity of the lights told Bart that he was a mentorian. Rainer won? Under the steady, stern, gray stare, Bart felt the slow, clutching suck of fear again. Was this man a slave of the Lahari who would turn him over to them? Or someone he could trust? His own mother had been a mentorian, after all. Who are you? Rainer One's voice was harsh and gave the impression of being loud, even though it wasn't. D David Briscoe. It was the wrong thing. The mentorian's mouth was taut, forbidding. Try again. I happen to know that David Briscoe is dead. I have a message for Rainer Three. On what business? I'll tell you that if you can tell me what the eighth color is. There was a glint in the grim eyes now, though the even stern voice didn't soften. I never knew myself. I didn't name it eight colors. Maybe it's the original owner you want. On a sudden hope, Bart asked, Was he by any chance named Rupert Steele? Rainer One made a suspicious movement. I can't imagine why you'd think so. Especially if you've just come in from Earth. He was never very widely known. He only changed the name to Eight Colors a few weeks ago. It's for sure that your ship didn't get any messages while the Lahari were in warp drive. You mentioned entirely too many names, but I notice you aren't giving out any further information. I'm looking for a man named Rupert Steele. I thought you were looking for Rainer Three. I can think of a lot of people who might want to know how I react to certain names and find out if I know the wrong people if they are the wrong people. What makes you think I'd admit it if I did? Now Bart thought they'd reached a deadlock. Somebody to trust somebody. This could go on all night, Perry and Riposte to question an evasive answer, each of them throwing back the other's questions in a verbal fencing match. Rainer One wasn't giving away any information, and considering what was probably at stake, Bart didn't blame him much. He flung the Mentorian cloak down on the table. This got me out of trouble the hard way. I never wore one before, and I never intend to begin. To not tend to again. I want to find Rupert Steele because he's my father. Your father. And just how are you going to prove that exceptionally interesting statement? Without warning, Bart lost his temper. I don't care whether I prove it or not. You try proving something for a change, why don't you? You know Rupert Steele. I don't have to prove who I am. Just take a good look at me. Or so Brosco told me. Man who called himself Brisco anyway. He gave me papers to travel under that name. I didn't ask for them. He shoved them in my hand. That Brosco is dead. Bart struck his fist hard on the desk and bend it over, bending over Rainer One angrily. He sent me to find a man named Rainer Three. The only one I really care about finding is my father. Now you know just as much as I do. How about giving me some information for a change? He ran out of breath and stood glaring down at Rainer, clust fenched, fists clenched. Rainer One got up and said, quick, savage, and quiet, "Did anyone see you come here?" Only the girl downstairs. How did you get through the Wahari? And that. He moved his head at the Mentorian cloak, and Bart explained briefly, and Rainer One shook his head. 
You were lucky. You could have been blinded. You must have inherited the flash accommodation from the Mentorian side. Rupert Steele didn't have it. I'll tell you this much. In a manner of speaking, you're my boss. Eight colors, it used to be called Alpha Trans Shipping, is what they call the middleman outfit. The interplanet cargo lines transport from planet to planet within a system. That's free competition. And the Lahari ships transport from star to star. That's a monopoly all over the galaxy. The middleman outfits arrange for orderly and business-like liaison between the two. Robert, Rupert Steele bought this company a long time ago, but he left it for me to manage until recently. Rainer punched a button into the image of the glossy girl at the desk. Violet, get three for me. You may have to send a message to the multiface. And he swung round to Bart again. You want a lot of explanations? We have to get them from somebody else. I don't know what this is all about. I don't want to know. I have to do business with the Lahari. The less I know, the less I'm apt to say to the wrong people. But I promised three that if you turned up or anyone came and asked for the eighth color, that I'd send you to him. That's all. He motioned Bart ungraciously to his seat and shut his mouth firmly, as if he'd already said too much. Bart sat, and after a while, he heard the elevator again. The panel slid open, and Rainer Three came into the room. It had to be Rainer Three. There was no one else like. There was no one else he could have been. It was as if Rainer. It was as if Rainer One was Tweedledum the Tweedledee, tall, stern, ascetic, and grim. He wore the full uniform of a Mentorian on Lahari ships, the white smock of a metallic blue cloak, the low silvery sandals. What? Hey, what's doing, Juan? Violet? And then he caught sight of Bart. His eyes narrowed, and he drew a quick breath, his face twisting up in apprehension and shock. He must be Steele's boy, he said, and immediately Bart saw the difference between the... Are they brothers? For Rainer One's face, controlled and stern, had not altered at all during their interview... But Rainer Three's smile was wry and kindly at once, and his voice was low and gentle. He's the image of Rupert. Did he come in on his own name? How'd he manage it? No. He had David, he had David Briscoe's papers. So the old man got through. Oh, that's not safe. Quick, give him to me, Bart. The Lahari have them. Rainer One walked to the window and said in his deadpan voice, It's useless. Get the kid out of here before they come looking for me. Look. He pointed, and below them the streets were alive with the uniformed Lahari and Mentorians, and Bart felt sick. If they had the same efficiency with red tape that we humans have, he'd never have made it this far. But you can count on them for their inefficiency, he said, and his eyes twinkled for a moment as he smiled. That's how it was so easy to work the old double shuffle trick on them. They had Steele's description, but not his name, so Briscoe took Steele's papers and managed to slip through. Once they landed on Earth, they had the Steele names, but by the time that cleared, you were outbound with another set of papers. It may have confused them, because they knew David Briscoe. David Briscoe was dead, and there was just a chance you were an innocent bystander who would raise a real row if they pulled you in. Did old Briscoe get away? No. He's dead. Rainer Three's mobile face held shocked sadness. Two brave men. Edmund Briscoe, the father, David Briscoe, the son. Remember the name, Bart, because I won't remember it. Why not? I'm a Mentorian, remember? <laughs> I'm good at not remembering things. Just be glad I remember Rupert Steele. If you'd been a few days later, I wouldn't have remembered him, though I promised to wait for you. Get him out of here, Three. Rupert Three swung to Bart. Put that on again. He indicated the mentorian cloak. Pull the hood right up over your head. Now, if we meet anyone, say a polite good afternoon in Lahari. You can speak Lahari and leave the rest of the talking to me. Bart felt like cringing as they came out of the street full of Lahari, but Rainer Three whispered, Attack is the best defense. I wanted to put one of the Lahari. What's going on, Rico Mori? A passenger on the ship got away without going through Decon Decontam. He may spread disease. So, of course, we've alerted all authorities. As the Lohari strode fast, Rainer Three grimaced. Mm, clever, that. Now the whole planet will be hunting for any stranger wearing themselves into fits about some unauthorized germ. We'd better get you to a safe place. My country house is a good way off, but I have a copter. Are you taking me to my father? Wait until we get to my place, Rainer Three said, leading, taking the controls and putting the machine in the air. Just lean back and enjoy the trip, yeah? Bart relaxed against the cushions, but he still felt apprehensive. Where was his father? If he was, if he was a fugitive from Lahari, he might be now, by now, be the other end of the galaxy. 
But if his father couldn't travel on Lahari ships, and if he'd been here, the chances were that he was still somewhere in the Procyon system. They flew for a long time, across low hills, patchwork agricultural district, districts, towns, and then for a long time over water. The copter had automatic controls, but Rainer III kept it on manual, and Bart wondered if the Mentorian just didn't want to talk. They began to descend at last toward a small green hill, bright in the last gold rays on sunset. A small, dome-like pink bubble rose out of the hill. Rainer Three set the copter neatly down on a platform that slid shut after them, unfastened their seat belts, and gave Bart a hand to climb out. He ushered him into a living room of glass and chrome, softly lit but deserted, deserted and faintly dusty. Rainer pressed a switch, and soft music came on, and the carpets caressed his feet. He motioned Bart to a chair. You're safe here, for a while. Although how long, nobody knows. But so far, I've been above suspicion. Bart leaned back. The chair was very comfortable, but the comfort didn't really help him relax. Where is my father? Rainer Three stood looking down at him, his mobile face drawn and strange. I guess I can't put it off any longer, he said softly, and then he covered his face with his hands. And from behind them, the hoarse words came, choked with emotion. Your father... Your father is dead, Bart. I... I killed him. For a moment, Bart stared, unable to move, frozen, his very ears refusing the words he heard. Had this all but another cruel trick, then trap, betrayal? He rose and looked wildly around the room, as if the glass walls were a cage closing in on him. Murder! He flung at Raynor and took a step toward him, his clenched fists coming up. He'd been shoved around too long, but here he had one of them right in front of him, and for once he'd hit back. He'd start be by taking Raynor apart, in small pieces. You, you, you rotten murderer! Raynor made no move to defend himself. Bart, Bart, sit down and listen to me. I, no, I'm no murderer. I shouldn't have put it that way. Bart's hands dropped to his sides, but he heard his voice crack with pain and grief. I suppose you'll tell me it was a spy or a traitor and you had to kill him? Not even that. I tried to save your father. I did everything I could. I'm no martyr, murderer, Bart. Bart, I, I killed him. Yes, heaven forgive me, because I'll never forgive myself. Bart's fists unclenched, and he stared down at Rainer Three, shaking his head in bewilderment and pain. I knew he was dead. I knew it all along. I was trying not to believe it, but I knew. I liked your father. I admired him. He took a long chance and had killed him. I could have stopped him. I should have stopped him. But how could I? Where did I have the right to stop him after what I did to... He stopped, almost in mid-word, as if a switch had been turned. But Bart wasn't listening. He swung away, striding to the wall as if he could kick it in, striking it with his two clenched fists, his whole being in revolt. Dad. Oh, Dad, if I kept going, I thought at the end of it you'd be here and it'd all be over. But here I am at the end of it all and you're not here. You won't ever be here again. Dimly, he knew when Rainer Three rose and left him alone, and he leaned his head on his clenched fists and cried. After a long time, he raised his head and blew his nose, his face setting itself in new, hard, unaccustomed lines, slowly coming to terms with a hard, painful reality. His father was dead. His dangerous, dead and earnest game of escape had no happy ending of reunion with his father. They couldn't sit together and laugh about how scared he had been. His father was dead, and he, Bart, was alone and in danger. His face looked very grim indeed, and years older than he was. After a long time, Rainer Three opened the door quietly. Come and have something to eat, Bart. I'm not hungry. Well, I am, and you ought to be. You'll need it. He pulled knobs, and the appropriate tails and tables and chairs extruded themselves from the walls. Rainer unsealed the hot cartons and spread them on the table, saying lightly, Mm, looks good, not that I can claim any credit. I subscribe to a food service that delivers them hot by a pneumatic tube. Bart felt sickened by the thought of eating, but when he put a polite fork in the food, he discovered that he was famished and ate up everything in sight. When they'd finished, Rainer dumped the cartons into a disposal chute, went to a small portable bar, and put a glass into his hand. Drink this. Bart touched his lips to his glass, made a face. Bart touched his lips to the glass, made a face, and put it away. Thanks, but I don't drink. Call it medicine. You'll need something. No, I have to tell you, and I don't want you going off half-primed in the middle of a sentence. 
you'd rather have a shot of tranquilizer, all right. Otherwise, I prescribe that you drink what I gave you. I really am a medic, you know. Feeling like a scolded child, Bart drank. It burned his mouth, but after it was down, he felt a sort of warm burning in his insides. It gradually spread a sense of well-being all through him. It wasn't alcohol, but whatever it was, it had quite a kick. Thanks. Why are you taking this trouble, Rainer? There must be danger. Don't you know? Well, obviously you don't. Your mother never said much about your Mandatorian family tree, I suppose. She was a Rainer. She, he smiled at Bart a little ruefully. I won't claim a kinsman's privileges until you decide how much to trust me. Well, it's a long story. I only know part of it. Our family, the Rainers, have traded with the Lahari for more generations than I can count. When I was a young man, I qualified as a medic on the Lahari ships. I've been star hopping ever since. People call us the slaves of the Lahari, and maybe we are. But I began it just because space is where I belong, and there's nowhere else I've ever wanted to be, and I'll take it at any price. I never questioned what I was doing until a few years ago. It was your father who made me wonder if we Mentorians were blind and selfish. This privilege ought to belong to everyone, not just the Lahari. More and more, the Lahari monopoly seemed wrong to me. But I was just a medic, and if I involved myself in any conspiracy against the Lahari, they'd find it out in the routine psych checking. Then we worked out how it could be done. Before every trip, with self-hypnosis and self-suggestion, I erased my own memories sort of artificial amnesia, so that the Lahari can't find out any more than what I want them to find out. Of course, it means that I have no memory while the Lahari ships of what I've agreed to while I'm... His face suddenly worked and his mouth moved without words if he'd, as if he'd run into some powerful barrier against speech. It was a full minute while Bart stared in dismay before he found his voice again. So far, it was just a sort of loose network, trying to put together the stray bits of information that Lahari didn't think important enough to censor. And then came the big breakthrough. There was a young apprentice astrogator named David Briscoe. He'd taken some runs and special test ships and read some extremely obscure research data from the early days of the contact between man and Lahari, and he had a wild idea. He did the bravest thing anyone's ever done. He stripped himself of all identifying data so that if he died, no one would be in trouble with the Lahari, and stowed away on the Lahari ship. Didn't he die in the warp drive? And slowly, Rainer Three shook his head. No, he didn't. No drowse, no cold sleep, but he didn't die. Don't you see, Bart? It's all a fake. The Lahari have just been saying that to justify their refusal to give us the secret of the catalyst that generates the warp drive frequencies. Such a simple lie, and it's worked for all these years. A Mentorian found him. Didn't have the heart to turn him over to the Lahari, but he so he smuggled clear again. When that Mentorian underwent the routine brain checks at the end of the voyage, the Lahari found out what had happened. They didn't know Briscoe's name, but they wrung out that Mentorian like a wet dishcloth and got a description that was as good as fingerprints. They tracked down young Briscoe and killed him. They killed the first man he talked to, they killed the second, and the third was your father. The murdering devils. Your father and Briscoe's father were old friends. Briscoe's father was dying with an incurable heart disease, and his son was dead. And old Briscoe had only one thought in his mind. Make sure he didn't die for nothing. So he took your father's papers, knowing they were as good as a death warrant, slipped away and boarded a Lahari ship and led roundabout to where the star to the stars where the message hadn't reached yet. He led them a good chase. Did he die or did they track him down and kill him? Bart bowed his head and told him the story. Mm. Meanwhile, your father came to me, knowing I was sympathetic, knowing I was a Lahari trained surgeon. He had just one thought in his mind to do again what David Briscoe had done. Make sure the news never got out, and make sure the news got out this time. He'd kick up a plan that was even braver and more desperate. He decided to sign on the Lahari ship as the member of the crew. As a... As a Mentorian? Bart asked, but something cold like ice water trickling down his back told him this, was, this wasn't what Brainer meant. The brainwashing? No. Not as a Mentorian. He couldn't have escaped the psych checking. As a Lahari? How... Men in Lahari are very much alike. A few small things, skin color, shape of the ears, hands, and claws keep humans from seeing that the Lahari are men. Don't say that. Those filthy murdering devils, you call those monsters men? I've lived among the Lahari all my life. They're not devils, Bart. They have their reasons. Physiologically, the Lahari are, well, humanoid, if you like that better. They're a lot more like a man than a man is like, for instance, a gorilla. Your father convinced me that with minor plastic and facial surgery, he could pass as Lahari. I finally gave in and did the surgery, and it 
killed him? Not really. It was a completely unforeseeable thing. A blood clot broke loose in a vein and lodged in his brain. He died in seconds. It could have happened at any time. Yet I feel responsible, even though I keep telling myself I'm not. And I'll help you as much as I can, for his sake and for your mother's. Well, Harry, don't watch me too closely. They figure that anything I'll do, I do, they'll catch in the brainwashing. But I'm still one half step ahead of them as so long as I can erase my own memories. Bart was sifting it all slowly in his mind. Why was, why was Dad doing this? What could he gain? You know we can build ships just as good as the Lahari ships. We don't know anything about the rare catalyst they use for warp drive fuel. Captain Steele had hopes of being able to discover where they got it. But they couldn't find out where the Lahari ships go for fueling? No, there's no way to trail a Lahari ship. We can follow them inside the star system, but, uh, well, when they pop into warp drive and we don't know where they go. But then they pop into warp drive and we don't know where they go when they aren't running between our stars. We've gathered what information together, what information we do have. We know that after a certain number of runs in our part of the galaxy, ships take off in the direction of the Antares. There's a ship due to come in here about ten days called the Swiftwing, which is just about due to make the Antares run. Captain Steele had managed to arrange, I don't know how and I don't want to know how, for a vacancy on that ship, and somehow he got credentials. You see, it's a very good spy system, a network between the stars, but the weak link is this. Everything, every message, every man has to travel back and forth by the Lahari ships themselves. And he rose, shaking it all off and And he rose, shaking it all off impatiently. Well, it's finished now. Your dad's dead. What are you going to do? If you want to go back to Vega, you can probably convince the Lahari you're just an innocent bystander. They don't hurt bystanders or children, Mark. They aren't bad people. They're just protecting their business monopoly. The safest way to handle it would be this. Let me erase your memories of what I told you tonight. And just let the Lahari capture you. They won't kill you. They'll just give you a light, sli light psych check. And when they swine you out, if you don't know anything, they'll send you back to Vega. You can spend the rest of your life in peace, running Vega Interplanet in eight colors. You mean go home and a good little boy and pretend none of this ever happened? What do you think I am, anyhow? What I want is a chance to go on where Dad left off. It won't be easy. It could be dangerous. There's nothing else to be done. We had the arrangements all made, and now somebody's got to take the dangerous risk of calling them off. Are you game for a little plastic surgery? Just enough to make change your looks again. With new forged papers. You can't go by the swift wing. It doesn't carry passengers. There's another route you can take. No. I know a better way. Let me go on the swift wing in Dad's place as a Lahari. Bart, no. You'd never get away with it. It's too dangerous. Why not? I speak Lahari better than Dad ever did. My eyes can stand Lahari lights. You said it to yourself. You said it yourself. It's going to be a dangerous job just calling off all the arrangements. So let's not. Just let me take Dad's place. Mart, you're only a boy. And what was Dave Briscoe? No, Rainer. Dad loved me a lot more than Big Andrew played, and you know it. I'll finish what he started. Then maybe I'll begin to deserve what he left me. Rainer three gripped at Bart's hand, and he said in a voice that shook, uh, all right, Bart. You're your father's son. I can't say more than that. I haven't any right to stop you. All right, Bart. Today we'll let you look at yourself. Bart smiled under the muffling layers of bandage around his face. His, ba his hands were bandaged, too, and he had not been permitted to look in a mirror. But the transition had been surprisingly painless. Or perhaps his sense of well-being had been due to a Rainer three slipping him some drug. He had been given injections of a chemical that would change the color of his skin. There had been minor operations on his face, his hands, and his feet. Let's see you get up and walk around. Bart obeyed awkwardly, and Rainer frowned. You hurt? Not exactly, but I feel as if I'm limping. That's to be expected. I changed the angle of the heel tendon to the muscle of the arch. You're using a different set of muscles when you walk. Until they harden up, you'll have some assorted Charlie horses. You got any trouble hearing me? No, I'd hear better without all these bandages. All in good time. Any trouble breathing? No, except for the bandages. Oh, fine. I changed the shape of your ears and nostrils, and it might have affected your hearing or breathing. Now listen, Bart. I'm going to take the bandages off your hands first. Sit down. Bart sat across the table from him, obediently sticking out his hands. And Rainer three said, Shut your eyes. Bart did as he was told and felt Rainer three's long fingers working at the bandages. Move each finger as I touch it. Bart obeyed, and Rainer said neutrally, Oh, good. 
Now, take a deep breath, and then open your eyes. Impatiently, Bart flicked his lids open. In spite of the warning, his breath went out in a harsh, jolting gasp. His hands lay on the table before him, but they were not his hands. The narrow, long fingers were pearl gray, tipped with whitish pink claws that curved out over the tips. Nervously, Bart moved one finger, and the long claw flicked out like a cat's and retracted. He swallowed. Golly! Beautiful job, if I say so myself. Be careful not to scratch yourself, and practice pick up, picking up small things. Bart saw that the long grayish claws were trembling. How did you make the claws? Quite simple, really. I injected protein compounds into the nail matrix, which sped up nail growth terrifically, and then as they grew, shaped them. Joining on those tiny muscles for the retracting me mechanism was the tricky part, though. Bart was moving his hands experimentally. Once over the shock, they felt quite normal. Claws didn't get in the way half as much as he'd expected when he picked up a pen that lay beside him, and with a blunt tip made a few of the strange-looking dots and wedges that were the Lahari alphabet. Mm, practice writing this, said Rainer Three, and laid a plastic-encased folder down beside him. It was a set of ship's paper printed in Lahari. Bart read it through, seeing that it was made out to the equivalent of Astrogator First Class Bartle. That's your name now, the name your father would have used. Memorize it. Get used to the sound of it. Practice writing it. Don't worry too much about the rating. It's an elementary one, what we'd call an apprentice rating, and I have a training tape for you anyhow. My brother got a hold of it. Don't ask me how, and don't ask him. When I'm going to see my face. I think you're ready for the shock. I almost threw you when I show your hands. He then made Bert walk out. He then made Bart walk around some more briefly, slowly, and he unwound the bandages, and then turned and picked up a mirror at the bottom of his medic's case, turning it right side up. Here, but take it easy. But when Bart looked in the mirror, he felt no unexpected shock, only an unnerving revulsion. His hair was bleached white and fluffy, almost feathery to the touch. His skin was grayish rose, and his eyelids had been altered just enough to make his eyes look long, narrow, and slanted. His, his nostrils were merely slits, and he moved his tongue over lips that felt oddly thin. I did as little to your teeth as I thought I could get away with, and I kept the front ones, Rainer Three told him. So if you get a toothache, you're out of luck. I wouldn't da you wouldn't dare go to a Lahari dentist. I could have done more, but it would have made you look too freakish when we changed you back to human again if you lived that long. I hadn't thought about that. And if Rainer's going to forget me, we will do it. The cold knot of fear, never wholly absent, moved in him again. And watching his face, Rainer Three said gently, well, It's a big network, Bart. I'm not telling you much for your own safety, but when you get to Antara, I said, tell you all you need to know. He lifted Bart's oddly clawed hands. I want you to remember, the change isn't completely reversible. Your hands will always look a little strange. The fingers had to be lengthened, for instance. I wanted to make you as safe as possible among the Lahari. I think you'll pass anything but, a wreck, but an x-ray. You know, be careful not to break any bones. And he gave Bart a package. This is a Lahari training tape. Listen to it as often as you can, then destroy it completely before you leave here. The swift, thing, the swift Wing is due in port three days from now, and they stay here a week. I don't know how we'll manage it, but I'll guarantee there'll be a vacancy of one astrogator first class on that ship. And now I'm going back into town and erasing the memory. He stopped, looking intently at Bart. So if you see me, stay away from me and don't speak, because I won't know you from any other Lahari. Understand? From here on, you're on your own, Bart. He held out his hand. This is the rough part, son. His face moved strangely. I'm a part of this network between the stars, but I don't know what I've done before, and I'll never know how it comes out. It's funny to stand here and look at you and then realize that I won't even remember you. The gold-glinted eyes blinked rapidly. Goodbye, Bart. Good luck, son. Bart took his hand, deeply moved with a strange sense that this was another death, a worse one than Briscoe's. He tried to speak and couldn't. Well, Ooh, careful those claws, little hard don't shake hands. He turned abruptly and went out the door and out of Bart's life, while Bart stood at the dome window, feeling alone as he'd never felt alone before. He had to wait six days, and they felt like six eternities. He played the training tape over and over. With his academy background, it wasn't nearly so difficult as he feared. He read and reread the set of papers identifying him as Astrogator First Class Bardo. Forge, he supposed. Or was there somewhere a real Bardo? The last morning he slept uneasily late. 
He finished his last meal as a human, spent part of the day removing all traces of his presence from Raynor's home, burned the training tape, and finally got the silky, silvery tights and cloak that Raynor had provided. He could use his hands now as if they belonged to him. He even found the claws handy and useful. He could write a signature and copy out instructions from the training tape without a moment's hesitation. Toward dusk, a young Lahari slipped unobserved out of Raynor's house and hiked unnoticed to the edges of a small city nearby, where he mingled with the crowd and hired a sky cab from an unobservant human driver to take him to the spaceport city. The sky cab driver was startled, but not or judged unusually so to pick up a Lahari pasture. Been doing a little sightseeing on our planet, eh? That's right, said Bart said in Universal, not trying to fake his idea of the Lahari accent. Raynor had told him that only a few of the Lahari had that char characteristic sibilant R and S and warned him against trying to imitate it. Just speak naturally. Their dialects of Lahari, just as their dialects are little different human languages, and they all sound different in the universal anyhow. Just looking around some. The Skycab driver frowned and looked down at his controls, and Bart felt curiously snubbed. Then he remembered. He himself had little to say to the Lahari when they spoke to him. He was an alien. A monster. He couldn't expect to be treated like a human being anymore. When the sky cab let him off before the spaceport, it felt strange to see how the crowds edged away from him as he made a way through them. He caught a glimpse of himself in one of the mirror ramps, a tall, thin, strange form in a metallic cloak, head crested with feathery white, and felt overwhelmingly homesick for his own familiar face. He was beginning to feel hungry, and realized that he couldn't go into an ordinary restaurant without attracting attention. There were refreshment stands all over the spaceport, and he briefly considered getting a snack at one of these. No, that was just putting it off. The time had come when he must face his fear and test his disguise among the Lahari themselves. Reviewing his knowledge of the construction of spaceports, he remembered that one side was the terminal, where humans and visitors and passengers were freely admitted, and the other side, for Lahari and their men, toy, and employees only, contained, along with business offices of many sorts, a sort of arcade with amusement centers, shops, and restaurants catering to the personnel of the Lahari ships. With nine or ten ships docking every day, Raynor had assured him that a strange Lahari face would be lost in the crowds very easily. He went to one of the doors marked Danger, Lahari Lights Beyond, and passed through the glaring corridor of the offices and storage warehouses, finally coming out into a sort of wide mall. The lights were fierce, but he could endure them without trouble now, though his head ached faintly. Rainer, testing his light tolerance, had assured him that he could endure anything the Lahari could without permanent damage to his optic nerves, though he would have headaches until he got used to them. There were small shops and what looked like bars, and a glass-fronted place with a sign lettered largely in black letters, a Lahari phrase meaning roughly, home away from home, meals served, spacemen welcome, reasonable. Behind him, a voice said in Lahari, Tell me, does that sign mean what it says? Or is this one of those traps for separating the unweary space, unwary spaceman from his hard-earned credits? How's the food? Bart carefully took hold of himself. Oh, I was just wondering that myself. He turned as he spoke, finding himself face to face with a young Lahari in the unadorned cloak of a spaceman without official rank. He knew the Lahari was young because his crest was still white. The young Lahari extended his claws at a closed fist, hidden claw gesture of Lahari greeting. Shall we take a chance? Ring, son of Rahan, greets you. Bartal, son of Berylun. I don't remember seeing you in the port, Bartal. I've mostly worked on the Polaris run. Way off there. Hmm. Ring, son of Rahan, sounded startled and impressed. You really get around, don't you? Shall we sit here? They sat on triangular chairs at a three-cornered table. Bart waited for Ring to order, and then ordered what he did. And when it came, it was a sort of egg and fish casserole, which Bart found extremely tasty and he dug into it with pleasure. Allowing for the claws, Lahari, Lahari table manners were not so much different from human. And remember, their customs differ as much as ours do. If you do something differently, they'll just think you're from another planet with a different culture. Have you been here long? A day or so. Off the swift wing. Wait, no. Have you been here long? A day or so. I'm off the swift wing. Well, I was told there's a vacancy on the swift wing. Ring looked at him curiously. There is, but... I'd like to know how you found it out. Captain Vorn, Neil says, anyone who talked about it would be sent to Cleto for three cycles. What happened to you? Miss your ship? No, I've just been laying off. Traveling, sightseeing, bumming around. But I'm tired of it, and now I'd like to sign out again. 
Well, we could use another man. This is a long run we're making. Out to Antares and then home. And if everybody has to work extra shifts, it's no fun. But if old Vormiel sees the... Knows there's been talk on the part about Glanaral jumping ship or whatever happened to him. Well, I'll have to walk wide of his temper. Bart was beginning to relax just a little bit. Ring apparently accepted him without scrutiny. At this close range, Ring didn't seem like a monster, but just a young fellow like himself. Hardy, good-natured. In fact, not unlike Tommy. Bart chased the thought away as soon as it sneaked into his brain. Are those things like Tommy? And then, rather grimly, he reminded himself, I'm one of those things. So how do I account for asking your captain for the place? I know, he said after a moment's thought. I told you. I say, I'll say you're an old friend of mine. You don't know what Bourne feels like when he gets mad, but what he doesn't know, he won't shout about. He shoved back the triangular chair. Who did tell you, anyway? This was the first real hurdle, and Bart's brain raced desperately, but Ring wasn't listening for an answer. I suppose somebody gossiped, or one of those fool Matorians picked it up. Got your papers? One rating. Astrogator, first class. Lanaron was second, but you can't have everything, I suppose. Ring led the way through the arcades, out across the garden sector, and past half a dozen of the huge ships lying in their pits. Finally, Ring stopped and pointed. There's the old Hulk. Bart had traveled only in Lahari passenger ships, which were new and fresh and sleek. This ship was enormous, ovoid like an egg of some space monster, the sides dented and discolored. Thin films of chemical discoloration lying over the glassy metallic hull. Bart followed a Ring. This was real. It was happening. He was signing out for his first interstellar cruise in one of the Lahari ships. Not a mentorian assistant, half trusted, half tolerated, but one of the crew themselves. If I'm lucky, he reminded himself grimly. There was Lahari, in the black banded officer's cloak at the doorway. He glanced at Ring's paper. Mm, a friend of mine, Ring said, and Bart proffered his folder. The Lahari gave it a casual glance and handed it back. Well, oh, Barley on board? <laughs> Where else? You don't think he'd, you don't think he'd relax with cargo not loaded, do you? It seemed casual and normal, and Bart's confidence was growing. They'd accepted him as one of themselves, but the great ordeal still lay before him. An interview with the Lahari captain, and the idea had Bart sweating scared. The corridors and decks seemed larger, wider, more spacious, but shabbier. Then on the clean, bright commercial passenger decks that Bart had seen. Dark lensed men were rolling bales of cargo along on wheeled dollies. The corridors seemed endless, more to hear the sound of his own voice and reassure himself of his capability to speak and be understood than because he cared, he asked Ring, What's your rating? Well, according to the logbooks, I'm an expert class two, meals fatigue. Sounds very technical and interesting, but what it means is I just go all over the ship, inch by inch, when I finish, start it all over again at the other end. Most of what I do is just boss around the maintenance crews and snarl at them with spots of rest in the paint. They got into a small, round elevator and ring-punched buttons. They began to rise slowly, creakily, toward the top. As for instance, I've been yelling for a new cable for six months. Take it easy, Bartol. Don't let Bourne yell scare you. He likes to hear the sound of his own voice, but we'd all walk out of the lock without spacesuits for him. The elevator slid to a stop, and the sign in Lahari letters said level of administration offers officer's deck. Ring pushed at a door and said, Captain Varn yell? I thought you were on leave. What are you doing here? Back here more than ten milliseconds before strap-in checks. Ring stepped back for Bart to go inside, and the small cabin with an elliptical bunk slung from the ceiling and the triangular table was dwarfed by a tall, thin lahari that looked with four of the black bands that seemed to denote rank among them. He had a deeply lined face with a lacework of tiny wrinkles around the slanted eyes. His crest was not the high, fluffy white of the young Lahari, but broken short near the scalp, grayish pink showing through, the little feathery ends yellowed with age. And he growled, Come in, then. Don't stand there. I suppose Ring's told you what a tyrant I am. What do you want from the top? Bart remembered being told that this was the Lahari equivalent of kid or youngster. He fumbled in the capricious folds of his cloak for his papers, and his voice sounded shrill, even to himself. Bartos, not a very good and respectful reading, Reiko Mori. Honorable, bald one, the Lahari equivalent was Sir. Ring told me there's a vacancy among astrogators, and I want to sign out. Unmistakably, Vorgel's sort of snort was with laughter. So you've been talking, Ring. Mm, better, I better than I tell one man that... Then that you have to hunt the planet over or run the long haul with the drive room watches short by one man. Well, 
Well, you're right. He growled and glared at Barrett. On the last planet, one of our men disappeared. Jump ship! Creases round his eyes deepened and troubled at this. Probably just got on the drift sightseeing, but I wish he'd told me. As it is, I wonder if he's been hurt or kidnapped or killed. Who daren't be reported? Bart knew with a cold chill that the missing Clannerol had simply not gone on a drift. No Lahari port would ever see Clannerol's second-class astrogator ever again. Bartol served on the Polaris run. You are a good long way off here, Robert, are you? Never been out that way yourself. Well, all right, I'll take you on. You can do system programming? Good. Writing in the second galaxy mathematics? He nodded and hauled out a thin sheet of wax-coated fabric, and his claws made rapid imprints on the surface. He passed it to Bard and pointed. Bard hesitated, and Bard and Gil said impatiently, Standard agreement. No hidden clauses. Put your mark on a feather top. Bart realized it was something like a fingerprint they wanted. Or pass anything but x-rays. He pressed the top of one claw onto the wax, and Vorengil nodded, shoved it on a shelf without looking at it. Oh, so much for that, said Ring, laughing as they came out. The bald one was in a good temper. Now to go to the port and celebrate. Oh, this dim place is very festive. You? I think I'll stay aboard. Well, if you change your mind, I'll be down there somewhere. See you later, shipmate. He raised his closed fist in farewell and went. Ooh, that was not a good gesture. I did not think that through. Ooh. Ooh. Glad the VOD cannot see that. Don't do that one. Mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm. Bart stood in the corridor, feeling astounded and strange. He belonged here. He had a right to be on board the ship. He wasn't sure what to do next. A Lahari, as short and fat as a Lahari could possibly be and still be a Lahari, came, or rather, waddled out of the captain's office. He saw Bartol and called, are you, are you the new first class? I'm Rugal, I'm the coordinator. Rugal had a huge, cleft, darkish scar across his lip, and there were two bands on his cloak. He was completely bald, and he huffed when he walked. Warrengill asked me to show you around. You'll share quarters with Ring. No sense shifting another man. Come down and see the chart rooms. What do you want to leave your kit in your cabin first? I don't have much. Rugal seemed lit wide. That's the way. Travel light when you're on the drift. Rugal took him down to the drive rooms, and here for a moment, in wonder and awe, Bart almost forgot his disguise. The old Lahari led him to the huge computer which filled one wall of the room, and Bart was smitten with the universality of mathematics. Here was something he knew he could handle. And he could do programming easily enough, but as he stood before the banks of complex yet beautifully familiar levers, the sheer exquisite complexity of it overcame him. To compute the movements of thousands of stars, all moving at different speeds in different directions in the vast, swirling, directionless chaos of the universe, and yet to be sure that every separate moment would come out within a quarter of a mile. It was something that no finite brain, man or Lahari, could ever accomplish, yet their limited brains had built these computers that could do it. Rugal watched him, laughing softly. Well, you'll have enough time down here. I'd like to have youngsters who are still in the middle of a love affair with their work. Come on, I'll show you your cabin. Rugal left them in the cabin amidships. A small and cramped one, but tidy. Two of the oval bunks slung at opposite ends, a small table between them, and drawers filled with pamphlets and manuals and maps. Furtively, ashamed of himself, yet driven by necessity, Bart searched Ring's belongings, wanting to get some idea of what possessions he ought to own. He looked around the shower and toilet facilities with extra care. This was something he couldn't slip up on and be considered even halfway normal. He was afraid Ring would come in and see him staring curiously at something as ordinary to Lahari as a cake of soap. He decided to go down to the port again and look around the shops. He was not afraid of being unable to handle his work. What he feared was living subtler details. Small items of every day, something as simple as a nail file could betray him. On his way, he looked into the recreation lounge filled with comfortable seats, vision screens, and what looked like simple pinball machines and mechanical games as still. There were also stacks of tape reels and headsets for listening, not unlike those humans used. Bart felt fascinated and wanted to explore, but decided he could do that later. Somehow he took the wrong turn coming out of the recreation lounge and went through a door, but a sudden dimming of the lights told him he was in mentorian quarters. The sudden darkness made him stumble, thrust out his hands to keep from falling, and an unmistakably human voice said, Ouch! Oh, I'm sorry. I'll admit the lights are dim, said the voice tartly in. Bart found himself looking down as his eyes adjusted to the new light level at a girl. She was small and slight, 
in a metallic blue cloak that swept out like wings around her thin shoulders. The hood framed a small, kitten-like face. She was a Mentorian, and she was human, and Bart's eyes rested with comfort on her face. She, on the other hand, was looking up with anxiety and uneasy distrust. It's right, I'm a Lahari, non-human freak. I seem to have missed my way. What are you looking for, sir? The medical quarters are through here. I'm looking for the elevator to the crew exits. Through here, she said, reopening the door through which he had come, and shading her large, lovely, long-lashed eyes with a slender hand. You took the wrong turn. Are you me one board? I thought all ships were laid out exactly alike. I, uh, I've only worked on passenger ships. I believe they are somewhat different. Well, that's your way, sir, said the girl, along with good Lahari. He felt as if he'd been snubbed and dismissed. What is your name? She stiffened as if about to salute. Meta, of the House of Marne Three, sir. Bart realized he was doing something wholly out of character for Lahari, chatting casually with a mentorian. With a wistful glance at the pretty girl, he said a stiff thank you and went down the ramp she had indicated. He felt horribly lonely. Being a freak wasn't going to be much fun. All right, folks, uh, we're at a chapter here, so I'm going to call it an evening. Uh, this has been... Oh, well, before we get into our outro, I should plug some things. Uh, if you're listening to this recorded... Uh, if any want to drop in live, these are live Thursday, or rather these are live Friday evenings at twitch.tv slash Glacier Nester. And uh, if you're watching this on Twitch, well, the and you missed some bits, well, this VOD goes up on Thursdays uh, around noon uh, on youtube.com slash user slash Glacier Nester. And uh, if you're looking for something else I do, I post an original piece of content on Mondays to YouTube. And uh, I stream a variety stream on Wednesdays uh, on Twitch. And uh, I also have a few other assorted things. Um, the stream VODs from Wednesday go up on Saturdays at a great delay. And finally, I do something called LGBT and D on Sunday evenings uh, with... A couple of my fellow streamers and it's a great time and i enjoy it a great deal if you want the vods on that so you can catch up uh, you're gonna have to head over to raz's planetarium on youtube but anyway that's all my plugs uh this has been paper cuts and i hope it didn't sting mm -hmm.